Good evening. Hello. My name is Crystal Phelps, and I am the Momentum Festival Manager with the Arts Commission. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're really excited to be able to bring this artist talk to you uh, via Zoom. So first of all, I want to say uh, thanks to the artists uh, for joining us. And uh, Momentum continues through October 23rd. So you still have time to check out our virtual content including the exhibition and artist market and other streaming series, as well as our discoverable content, like the Discover Toledo scavenger hunt, the Toledo Alphabet Project, and other things. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get started. I'd like to uh, invite Jordan Busher, who is also with the Arts Commission and our Artist Services Manager. Hello, Jordan. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Crystal. Um, I'm excited to share with everyone um, a little bit about the panelists who selected the artists for the 2020 exhibition. We, so we had a selection panel with three members that included Lauren Applebaum, the Associate Curator of American Art at the Toledo Museum of Art, Jova Lynn, an artist and the Senior Curator at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, and Alex Pike artist and founder and director of Tiger Strikes Asteroid, a nonprofit network of artist run spaces across the United States. So those three panelists selected 12 artists to participate in this exhibition. And those artists are Deb Davis, Brent Dadas, Lauren Fowler, Beth Jensen, Lindsay Haynes, Natalie Lanise, Lorraine Lynn, Tom Marino, Katrina Nieswander, Deborah Orloff, Mike Osborne and Tim, Timothy Stover. And you can see their work on the Arts Commission's website. On the main page, you'll be able to scroll down just a bit and see the 2020 exhibition linked there. So you can see the artist's work there, but um, luckily we get to hear from several artists tonight. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first artist to speak about their work, Deb Davis. Welcome, Deb. I'm getting everything started here and there we go. Good evening, everybody. I hope you're doing well um, on this uh, fall evening, nice fall evening, bit cold. So I'm going to share my screen with you and give you a little background about me while I'm doing all of this. Um, I am a um, <clears throat> professor at the University of Toledo. I came to Toledo in uh, 2000 and I've been here over the years. And over those years, I have been a faculty member at the University of Toledo and a chair of the department and a dean of the college, several colleges <laughs> throughout the process. So while I was in those administrative roles, I wasn't really making a whole lot of art as most of my time was spent um, administering. So I, I, I came out of my BFA or my MFA rather as a photographer and was working photographically. And when I came back to uh, making art and returning to the classroom uh, recently, I decided that I wanted to get back into more of the tactile materials that I had used earlier in my career. And so I returned to painting, printmaking and mixed media. So you're seeing one of my small examples here on the front and then we'll move forward. So the work that um, we're going to look at and one of the pieces in the show all started with an impetus from this particular piece, which is actually a photographic collage uh, surfacing 62 plus four. And this I did in 2017. It was after a diagnosis of cancer and dealing with chemo and um, all of the things that had to do with that including um, not being able to drink cold water if it would, or it would feel like there were needles on your tongue. And so there are a lot of elements and references to the process of having to deal with all that. Whether you know that or not is not important. Um, uh, you can bring to this work whatever you want to, but I wanted to show you that this is where the photographic piece uh, began. And you'll see some of the similar elements happening uh, when I shifted my work to, um, uh, uh, the two-dimensional uh, mixed media. And I feel that abstraction allows for a broader interpretation of an artwork's context. So you can bring to it a bit more than if something looks realistic and it's more defined for you. So uh, these are some examples of abstraction. I do 
um, also uh, some work that's more realistic. This is disruptive surrender. Uh, it's a pretty large piece, 40 inches by 53 inches. It's actually on um, oil paper that you can paint with oil paints on and it is uh, mounted on dye bond. So this is a very large work. And again, this work was built off of um, that concept of recovery and um, moving forward, but also marking, lots of marking of having to go to this and having to have this treatment and having to do that. So there's a lot of repetition and reuse of elements throughout um, this particular piece and also a bit of chaos and disruption, obviously, since this was a huge, a huge life disruption for me. Um, the series of the piece that was uh, brought into the show is the Interrupted Journey series, again, working off that idea. Uh, life's a journey with periods of flow, punctuated with jolts and disturbances, elements of chaos, continually swirl beneath the surface. So things that we don't know are there and are brewing and all of a sudden it hits you and then you're, you're dealing with it, just like we're all dealing right now with COVID. No, none of us thought that we were going to have to deal like some, with something like this throughout our lives. In chaos theory, a very small change can make any organization behave very differently impacted by underlying patterns, repetition, and interconnectedness. And again, we are feeling this in spades. It is just so incredible how much of all of this that's going on for us has interrupted our daily lives in the way that we work, in the way that we go to school, in the way that we communicate with our families, in the way that we have um, art events, even as we are working here on um, uh, Zoom. So, it utilizes elements found in each of the works, recombining, sometimes enlarging and sometimes contracting while impacting the visual interpretation. So the series starts out from an image and then it goes in and it zooms in, it collects parts from that image and adds them into the following images. So this is adaptation and this is the piece that was selected for the show. And I was thinking of lots of things such as um, we're dealing with climate change and many things that are chaotic in the world and how they impact one another. So when one um, element happens, one thing happens, then multiple things happen. We could think of the fires in the West. We could think of um, hurricanes um, as they've come um, on land, all of those things. And so we're in this sort of chaotic battle with um, what is happening. and. This is um, the piece that was uh, juried into the exhibition here uh, for Momentum. So it's a mix of watercolor, gesso, and pastel. And this is another one in that same series. This is working a different way. This is in cold wax medium. And I don't know, oops, I should, not old wax medium, but cold wax medium, there should be a C there. Um, and cold wax is actually, oil paint mixed with a wax medium and then you work with it on the surface with a lot of spatula like things is the best way to describe it. You can carve into it, you can do multiple layers, you can put layers down and then put other layers on top of it. So for me, the medium itself really spoke to the whole concept of all of these chaotic things happening underneath and it allows me to go ahead and cover areas and open up areas and um, work differently then, um, but not unsimilar to what I've done in Photoshop um, when I work digitally with my photographs. This is variation number two. And again, this is zooming in and coming a little closer to the actual um, elements that are in uh, the work that I'm working with. And um, there's a lot of different materials in here as well. There's some um, pastels and some water soluble um, watercolors, et cetera, mixed with the oil, believe it or not. So there is, there's a lot of different things. Things have to dry for a while and then you go back in and work with them also. Again, that chaotic nature is what I was looking for on these. This is venturing further. Um, and this one zooms in on some of the very minute or smaller pieces and elements of um, the others and builds on those. And so you get these, hierarchical uh, triangle structures that are coming in and stacking on top of one another. So there's somewhat of a scientific reference. And um, at the same time, there are parts that are trying to fit to the whole. Uh, and again, the 
black area that's in here interrupts all of this um, disturbance and becomes very solid, but it is sort of influencing the rest of what's taking place. Um, venturing further. Um, these are uh, pieces that were done after those works for Interrupted Journey. These are our serotonin dispersal, and this has to do with the dispersal of seeds in the environment. All plants will release their seeds in a different way, and some of them do it with uh, a high wind that comes along or and, and takes it. So if you think of a dandelion, that kind of thing. And um, when that happens, then that causes the next thing to happen. And so this is all about that um, theory of something happening and causing a situation to impact another situation. Again, these are, these are oil on um, paper, paper uh, designed for painting with oils. And uh, some other work that's back on the top of it with some um, uh, RF paint sticks and some graphite and charcoal once the oil has completely dried um, on the surface and then working on top of those. And I really like having the ability to um, draw minutia into these pieces, uh, small elements um, as I'm working. And uh, this is number two and number four, sorry. Um, so number two and number four of this series. Um, and then this is number five and number six of the series. So they're all interrelated, um, but they, they um, work off of one another and at the same time they speak individually. So when I display these, I generally display them as a grouping uh, because I see them together, but they could uh, stand on their own um, if they, if I wanted them to. I just uh, work with them in a series. So that is all I had for this evening, you guys, because I didn't want to overwhelm anybody. I don't know how many minutes I took, so <laughs> we'll go on to the next person then, <laughs> okay? Thanks so much, Deb. You're welcome. Um, I just wanted to add in that there will be time at the end of all the presentations for questions from anyone who's viewing this from home. So um, hold those questions until the end and there will be a chance to ask the artists and continue the conversation. And now I'd like to introduce Katrina Nieswander. Hello. Hi, um, I'm Katrina Nicewander. I'm an artist working out of Toledo, Ohio in my studio. This is my studio here. Um, I love being in Toledo. I think the arts are a big, beautiful thing in Toledo and I'm excited to be a part of this. So I just wanna say that to start. Um, being an artist and an interior designer, the through line of all of my work is what feels like home to me. Um, when I was in college working on what I wanted to do with my fine art and what I wanted to make, I was also helping my family members go through a lot of things from deaths in the family. My grandparents collected a lot of antiques. Um, my family members were selling things on eBay. So they just collected this massive amount of stuff. And as we were going through things, we found all of these photos tucked in a closet and going through those, I just had this complex amount of feelings that overwhelmed me, just connection, but also a separation. There's always photos that um, a lot of us find when we're going through those sort of things where we don't necessarily know who the people are, but we feel this kind of a connection. So I found myself starting to collect myself and I started to collect these old photographs and work from them and kind of explore these ideas of, you know, what's important? What, what is this feeling of connection? What is nostalgia? Um, how, how is a humanity, how have we changed over time? Um, family dynamics, rituals, the, the small moments that we choose to document in these photographs and what makes them important. So it's kind of all about processing the human experience for me. Um, life, loss, memory, time, playing with all of that 
and um, just personally processing really. Um, that being said, this image that is in the exhibition isn't all that deep. Um, 2020, kind of a wild year. Um, a lot of us are going through a lot and I felt called in my practice to go a little bit lighter. So I looked through my collection of images and I pulled out some that I thought were really fun and just started working with them intuitively. I often work with mixed media directly on the photographs. I've um, made plenty of work where I'm directly painting and doing everything by hand. Stuff like this, this is some of my work from a few years ago, but directly working on the photograph is this actual play with the subject of the photograph. You can sit and you can think, what was this moment like? What were these people like? And kind of have a dialogue and give them new life in an interesting way. So I found this photograph here, this gentleman. It says on the back, this is Jerry. Don't know if that's the fish or the man. I'm guessing it's the man. But um, I loved his little stance here. Very sassy, very proud. And there's this whole thing with men that love to fish. It's this primal thing, I think. They wanna you know, get a picture with it. I'm not on dating apps, but I hear <laughs> that there are a lot of pictures of guys holding up fish on dating apps. Must be this whole like, you know, look at me, I'm a provider, you know, look at this catch, I'm a catch. So I called it, what a catch. So I took this image and I can bring it. These are some other images from the series that I played with earlier this year. I made all of them in the summer, so fairly recently. Um, so this is the image. I kind of muted the background with the watercolor directly on this archival photo reproduction that I blew up. And then I reproduced him in this kind of pop art fashion, playing with the way that he's standing with that pop of the hip. And then I took that catch and I added some color and some iridescence. I don't know if you can see it. It's a little high contrast with how I have the light. In person, it's a little less contrasty. Um, but I played with that and tried to make it look like this magical fish, just as magical as, you know, he looks like he's feeling and it's, you know, the catch that he, thinks he is, or he may have been. <laughs> so that is me and my work. And if you enjoy my work, I'm pretty active on Instagram. It can be found at Katrina, like the hurricane, N as in November, art as in art. Um, Katrina and Art on Instagram. I can be found on Facebook. And then also, if you're interested in other ways that we manifest what feels like home and in interior design, I have some interior design uh, stuff that I do on there, helping people with their homes and interacting. I have a free Facebook group called Your Authentic Space. If you want to join me and just kind of play with that concept of, of how we create spaces that are authentically ours and that nurture us and bring elements like our past and elements of what we want our future to look like into our homes as well. So that's me. Awesome, thank you so much, Katrina. So um, next up we have Beth Jensen. Beth, welcome. Hi. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Beth Jensen. I'm an artist here in Northwest Ohio, and my focus has always been landscape painting and painting the landscape of Northwest Ohio. I'm kind of fascinated with the flatness and the rhythm of corn stalks and the land, um, some of the water, bodies of water, the Maumee River, Lake Erie, and uh, so I've always painted in traditional oils, but a few years ago, I kind of fell into an encaustic oil painting class, just something to try new. And I know Deb was talking earlier about uh, oil and cold wax. Well, encaustic painting, you're using hot wax. 
and it has a very long tradition. I mean, it dates back to fifth century Greek, Greece, where the Greeks would uh, coat their sailing ships with wax to preserve them and keep them waterproof in the water. And someone got the bright idea that, hey, if we add some color to our, our wax, we can actually paint images on the ships. So they started painting and decorating their ships. And then as Greeks migrated into Egypt, uh, they can trace back to second century AD, um, the death portraits that they would make on birch wood with encaustic paint and put in the mummy uh, case so that in the afterlife, uh, people could see what that person looked like in their life on earth. Um, so I got into the encaustic painting and um, I'm gonna show you a little demo. And so I'm working, I'm gonna put, just push this down a little so you can see my palette. But you can see that um, this is an anodized aluminum palette. It's heated to 200 degrees. I have my thermometer here. And the wax that I use is RNF paints. It's uh, pre-mixed encaustic. So it's beeswax and uh, oil paint and DeMar varnish. And they come in little blocks like this. And I can easily take that block and just dissolve it on to the palette and heat that. I can thin it if I want to with encaustic medium to make it more transparent. This is a very luminous, delicious um, paint. And I have an encaustic panel. So this is just coated with encaustic gesso so that it's more absorbent than your, than your regular acrylic gesso. And I'm holding it up so it's gonna be a little drippy, but I can quickly put some layers onto this board. Even add some pops of color here and there. And as Deb was mentioning, with the paint and wax, you can build layers. Now with encaustic, you do have to heat or, or fuse between layers. So I have a heat gun here um, that I can fuse the paint and then I can keep building and building layers. And you can actually use encaustic with a lot of different techniques with photography, I'll put it a little closer here. You can really make this paint move. So I'm just gonna kick it up a notch so you can see how I can actually use the heat gun. To really move that paint. But with encaustic, you can do a lot, a lot of things um, that work with any medium. So if you work in photography, you can um, transfer images into the wax um, with collage. You can collage things. Anything natural works really well. So this is like a little bit of a collage with natural um, flowers and things from outdoors. Um, you can sculpt with it. And this is just shows how you can carve back into it. Um, I'll kind of move this a little bit so you can see the texture. But you can carve back into it. Um, you can add all kinds of elements. You can print onto it. Here's another example with, I just use some objects to print and add texture, just like sponges and different things like that to add texture into it. And the really fun thing is that, um, you know, you're always experimenting, you know, it, the, it's playing with the, with the elements, with the wax, um, with the surfaces. And you can always, if you don't like it, you can scrape it back, you can melt it off. And sometimes I've gotten some really, really interesting pieces that I've kept because I thought, oh, I'm just done with this and I've started to melt it off and it's, and it's come up with some really interesting effects that I've gone on to work on, on various pieces. Um, I'll just lift something up. This is a more traditional type of, of large piece that I'm doing with a, a landscape. You can see the top of that. So with the large pieces, I'll actually fill cups, aluminum cups with the wax and melt it into cups so that I can pour and, and, and then tip and so forth with the, with the piece of work with the um, substrate. Um, so I, I, I started working in the encaustic, like I said, about four years ago. And a couple of years ago, I decided that I, I wanted to share this opportunity with other people. So I went to RNF Paints in Kingston, New York and took an advanced teaching course in encaustic. And I um, 
then went to the Arts Commission and with their wonderful uh, grant program and received a grant to buy supplies. So I actually have six of these um, andonized aluminum pallets and all kinds of supplies that I've collected and picked up. And I do classes at Shadell Gardens, uh, the Finley Arts League and various places in Northwest Ohio. Um, you can find classes on my website, bethjunson.com. And um, in fact, I have a class tomorrow in Finley. Um, and you can come and just try it and play with, I bring tons and tons and tons of whole, you know, truckload of materials that you can play with. And I show you different techniques and how to do it. So it's really a fun time. Um, and um, my, my two pieces that are currently in the show that you'll see on the Momentum website are actually hanging in the show, uh, Toledo Federation of the Arts show at 20 North Gallery, and they are for sale at the, at the gallery. I also have a lot of my encaustic work at Mila Marcus Winery in Bowling Green, and that'll be there through the end of the year. Uh, and I am planning some demos, some additional demos there. So you can come and have a glass of wine, watch a demo, do a small piece. Uh, we do some printmaking on the, right on the palette. Um, and I have some little canvases that you can try to take and make a piece to take home. So, um, you know, look for my work out there and come to a class because this process is absolutely fun and you don't have to have any art background to do it. So thank you for allowing me to tell you about encaustic painting. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Beth. I look forward to seeing more of your work in person when we can get back out into the world a little bit. Um, so our uh, next artist that we have giving a little talk for us this evening is Deborah Orloff. Deborah, welcome. Hello. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Thanks for joining us. Good. All right. I'm going to share my screen. <laughs> It's just what we do these days. All right, you guys seen my slide? Okay, so um, I'm originally from New York City, uh, but I've been in Toledo for quite a while. Uh, I am the Associate Chair of the Department of Art at the University of Toledo, where I am also the Head of uh, Photography and Digital Media, and I'm a professor. And of course, I'm also a local professional artist. So uh, tonight, what I'd like to do is share some work from a, a large body of work that uh, actually started back in 2013 and give you some context for the work that, that's in the show. Uh, so this, this project called Elusive Memory, uh, as I said, the actual project started in 2013, but the ideas behind this had actually started simmering uh, back in 2007. Uh, when my father died suddenly and when he was, uh, when I was writing his eulogy, it occurred to me that as I was drawing upon memories, every single memory I had, I was seeing in my mind as a photograph. And I, I started wondering if I really remembered these things or if I just remembered the photographs. And so I had been thinking about this connection between photography and memory uh, for quite a while. And, and I knew that I wanted to make work about that and I didn't really know what that was gonna look like. So like I said, I just let it simmer for a while. Um, but then in um, about, probably about 2012 or 2013, um, when his house was sold and they were cleaning it out, there were these cartons full of uh, old photographs and slides and all sorts of things that had been in the basement. And um, which I, of course, as soon as my brother-in-law called me, and was like, we're about to pitch this stuff. You don't want it, do you? I'm like, yes, I do. <laughs> don't, and I had no idea what was gonna be in these boxes. Um, but I eventually I got the boxes back here and started going through the stuff. And what I found was all of these family photographs um, because they were sitting in the basement on the floor and the basement had flooded numerous times and nobody bothered to actually try to save the photographs and dry them out. Um, many of the photographs had gotten moldy and they were stuck together and so I, I started looking at these and, you know, again, I wasn't sure exactly what I was going to do with them, but so I started photographing them and these are really small objects. So, so it wasn't until I photographed them and then saw them enlarged on the computer and saw all this incredible detail and, and sort of how beautiful this 
inadvertent transformation was that I, I realized that these damaged pictures really spoke to that connection between photography and memory that I'd been thinking about. And so I started photographing these objects. Um, this gives you a little bit of a sense of um, the image on the left will give you a little bit of a sense of what this looks like in a gallery space finished and, and gives you a sense of the scale. Um, and, you know, in, in some ways, the, the work is very personal because they're, they're family photographs. They're my family. This is actually my father when he was a, a teenager. Um, and so you're going to see a lot of photographs of my family today. But this really isn't about me. Um, this is really about this complicated relationship that we all have uh, culturally between photography and memory. And, and really, it's a meditation on the significance of um, vernacular photographs as aesthetic objects, as well as um, cultural artifacts. And so um, I'm going to just kind of give you a sense of, of this project. Um, one of the things I think about is, um, you know, the, what, what, these, what these were originally. So this, this was a professional portrait done in a studio by a professional photographer of me as a baby. Um, and I think about the fact that, you know, I mean, there's almost nothing left of this now, but originally when this print was made, this was something really precious. Um, you know, the, my parents went and had me, you know, in a, in the photo studio, they had these, I'm sure they had dozens of these prints made and framed and handed out to relatives and they were in people's wallets. And, and, and then I think about how eventually this precious object kind of moved from maybe a frame or a wallet was replaced by maybe a, a newer image. And then maybe it eventually ended up in a drawer and then eventually it ended up in a box and eventually it ended up in the basement. And then it eventually ends up in Toledo looking like this. And so I, I think about the, the history of these objects. Um, and one of the things that happens when these are enlarged to 42 inches is that these textures which you really can't see when you look at the original object you know this is a wallet sized photograph um, when it's enlarged to 42 inches suddenly the cracked emulsion starts to look more like peeling paint and it becomes something really completely different and i, I was just fascinated by that so um so again just just for clarity here so I'm, I'm taking these really small objects you know they're typically two by three three and a half by five and i'm i'm photographing them and enlarging them to almost four feet so they they really become these these kind of monuments um and these details that you again you can't really see with the naked eye become something completely different. So you see these textures, you see these tiny little fibers that are almost invisible in the original object become almost more like hair. Um, and so I, I, it was important to, to keep them the size, to keep them 42 inches in order to see that kind of detail. Uh, so here, here are a couple of shots to show you. These were just taken with my phone so you can get a sense of um, how I'm working. Uh, so you can see I'm, I'm using studio lighting, I'm photographing these on a copy stand, and I'm playing just ever so slightly with the light to be able to get those shadows so that you get that kind of trompe l'oeil effect so that they look like they're more three dimensional than they really are. I mean, again, they're flat photographs, but when you see the prints, they look like they're, they're three dimensional. And in the image on the, the bottom there, you can see how small, you know, these objects are. So again, they're typically two, three, four inches maximum. Um, and, and I'm also um, really interested in the physicality of these objects that I'm photographing. So the work is very much about that physicality. And I, I love that like in this one, the, you know, this is a Polaroid and, um, you know, the distinctive shapes and edges and borders and perforations and things that photographs don't have anymore. So they they definitely speak to a very particular time, both culturally and in the history of photography. Um, but the, the physicality of photographs is something that's really changed a lot. I mean, as artists, we print our images, but culturally, we don't really print family photographs that much anymore. I mean, most people have a, a zillion photographs on their phone, but almost never print them. 
And, and I think about the fact that these were objects that were held, you know, they were, they were very much held in the hand, they're tactile. And so as I'm photographing them, and again, using that studio lighting to, to get just these sort of slight shadows in order to um, emphasize these textures, because I really want, um, I, I want the viewer to, to be aware of the physicality and when they're standing in the gallery looking at these, that there's, they feel like they're in the presence of this original object. Um, this one is actually a, this image on top is a snapshot of my parents when they were dating. And I, I was really struck by the, the way the emulsion is, is literally coming off uh, the backing of the paper. And I feel like, you know, both of my parents are, are gone now and this moment obviously is gone. And I feel like when the rest of this emulsion peels off and, and that's like, that's the end of that moment. Like it's just gone forever. And I'm like the last, uh, the last person to even be aware of this. And, you know, so thinking about sort of that ephemeral nature of both, you know, photography and memory. Um, I feel like this, for me at least, this photograph really speaks to that. Um, you know, and, and like memory, you know, these images are, are they're fragmented, they're decayed, you know, identities are lost or, or masked. And, and so th these become a, a metaphor for, for loss. I mean, not just for uh, loss of life, but also loss of memory. Uh, and, I, and I think about how um, a lot of cultural critics have talked about um, how photographs sort of uh, represent, photographs of people specifically represent the sort of death and like sort of life and death past and future at the same time and kind of you see people young, but it also, the photograph also predicts their ultimate demise um, and their vulnerability. And, um, this photograph in particular, which is a portrait of my parents, uh, I feel like seeing them in, in their youth or again, what's what, the little bit of information we can see, um, that really becomes very poignant for me thinking about that, the, that sort of cycle. Uh, this is the photograph that's, that's in the show. It's called Remembering Uncle Philip. And um, this photo, the photograph that's on top. So this is I'm basically creating like a collage and then photographing it. So this photograph that's on top, uh, when I first saw this, I, I thought it might be uh, a very good friend of my father's, uh, whose name is Philip. And we, used to, as a kid, we used to call him Uncle Philip. And then um, I realized <laughs> I had no idea what Philip looked like. I couldn't remember what he actually looked like, and so. I called this remembering Uncle Philip ironically. Um, and, you know, so for me, again, this is speaking to the way we either misremember or how we um, connect and disconnect memory and photography. Uh, another example of that is, is this image, which is called My Favorite Dress. And the title also comes from a, a similar experience where when I, when I first saw this image on top, this is actually me in nursery school, I immediately remembered this, this gray velvet dress with the, there was a pink satin ribbon. And I, and I saw this and said, oh, my, that's my, that was my favorite dress in nursery school. And then I, I realized there's no way I remember a dress I wore when I was four years old. I could barely remember something from last week. And so what I realized is that this is what Marion Hirsch would call a, a, um, a post memory or a mediated memory where what I actually remember is my mother telling me, showing me photographs and showing me a photograph where the um, sash is actually visible and telling me that this was my favorite dress. But in my mind, um, that experience of being told the story and equating it with that photograph and then seeing this, it sort of became a, a memory. So, so this idea of, of how we remember, or at least we think we remember and we fabricate these memories <laughs> from photographs. Um, so there's this, that sort of slipperiness um, that, I'm, that I'm very interested in. Um, and then this, is, uh, this was one of 25 uh, very, very tiny black and white photographs I found that were all very similarly faded and had that, the sepia color. And they all had this, this real ghost-like um, quality about them. And I was really struck by that. 
Um, and But when I photographed them and enlarged them, they had no texture. So unlike the other images that I just showed you that had all these interesting textures when they were enlarged, these were still really, really smooth. And so I decided rather than um, enlarge them, I would do the opposite. I decided I wanted to make it really hard for the viewer to see them. And so this is an installation I did um, this past spring uh, called In Search of Memory. And so what I wanted to do was, the, so each of these are anywhere from two by three to five by seven um, and they're prints. So they're photographs of photographs printed and then mounted on aluminum and then floated at slightly different depths off the wall. And um, and I wanted this to be about the experience of trying to remember and how when you're trying to remember something and you can't quite remember and you're sort of seeing little bits and pieces, I was trying to basically replicate that experience in this piece. Um, so these are some different shots of the installation. This was in our faculty show, actually Deb Davis's <laughs> piece is there on the left. Um, and this, this gives you a sense of what it looked like in the gallery. Um, so this is at the Center for the Visual Arts, um, which is the University of Toledo next to the Museum of Art. And this is where the art department is. Um, so I'm probably out of time. So I want to just um, leave you with something uh, that Susan Sontag said that really resonates for me. And that is, uh, in America, the photographer is not simply the person who records the past, but the one who invents it. And I will leave you there. So thank you. Very fascinating material, Deborah. Thank you so much for uh, shining a little more light onto uh, your work. Really appreciate that. So we are going to round out our evening with a presentation from Brent Datos. Brent, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Crystal. And. Um, I want to say thanks to the uh, Arts Commission in Toledo for inviting me to um, speak about my work. Uh, so I will um, share my screen here for you. And uh, before I forget, um, I will also say that um, I uh, teach at the University of South Carolina in the School of Visual Art and Design. Um, and so with this particular uh, group of work that I'm talking about right here, I wanted to, to say that it um, is, uh, these are drawings that I did 15 years ago or more than 15 years ago. And um, they are drawings on top of photographs. These are anonymous photographs of war. And I was exploring this idea, uh, this relationship between the worker and the soldier. And this is a drawing of um, some medics and uh, it's iron oxide and white gouache on, on top of a photograph. And um, I think it's important to say that my grandfather was a medic in World War II and he was on the beach uh, on D-Day and he was just, just down the beach from Normandy. So he, he saw a lot of violence and death and um, it's something that I've thought a lot about over the years and so that's, um, sort of the part of the process of me thinking through this and trying to bring those reflections into my work. And I'm showing this um, because um, I, I, I choose materials to make art with. I choose materials that are, uh, that have a voice of their own. I'm looking for materials that fight me back. Um, and so I started to experiment with uh, drawings on sheets of metal with acids and this is a, um, a work that I did on a piece of copper that was suspended over a vat of acid for many months. So no acid actually touched the surface of the work. Those are all vapors that are just causing this very subtle reaction over time. And then this is um, a work that I did um, with German silver on copper. And um, I like to have a conversation with the materials where there's a reaction that occurs and then I have to respond as a part of um, it, the process of making the work. And so I, I like this idea of the unexpected uh, happening. This is a, um, a, a large vat, uh, sort of a big tray that I, that I built 
Um, and this was my studio in my in my mom's barn just outside of Louisville, Kentucky. And I, I built this so that I could treat many different pieces of copper and sheets of rolls of, of, of steel um, that I was working with. I could treat them all evenly at the same time under the same conditions. Um, and then I will say that this uh, paper that you're looking at here, which is about five feet tall by seven uh, feet wide, um, this is Tyvek paper, which they use on construction sites as a moisture barrier. Um, and um, I spent my childhood on construction sites. Um, and so instead of using the, the patinas um, on, the, on the sheets of copper, which I was getting um, all, all the colors that you saw there were, were chemical reactions creating the, 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 the patinas. I decided to draw with uh, rust and, and oxidation itself. And so this is red iron oxide and yellow iron oxide on um, Tyvek. These uh, pieces that you're seeing here are um, five foot by five foot and they are also on Tyvek. They are rust, red iron oxide and white acrylic paint. And I'm taking um, two by fours and construction materials, pieces of rebar and metal, and I'm letting things pool up on the paper surface. And so I'm, I, I'm collaborating with time and reaction. And, and uh, as things evaporate, there are lines of evaporation that occur um, as well as the marks that I'm making. These are rust um, marks on, uh, this is five feet by 10 feet uh, long. And this is rust on and white and black paint on Tyvek. And this is from a series called Bloodlines, um, where the marks are very much like topographical maps. And, um, and again, using like two by fours and there's some correction tape on this one. And that was the work, you know, using these construction materials, thinking about, um, thinking about the landscape from an aerial perspective and sort of exploring abstraction. This is me working in my Toledo um, studio at the time. I had a studio down on Huron Street. It was close to the baseball field. And uh, this is more for a, you know, uh, for a size reference. Um, and then this is the final piece. Uh, this is uh, 10 feet wide by seven and a half feet tall. And um, there's uh, yellow iron oxide, inks and um, paint, and just probably some ver other various media on there. And that's a scale reference for what the work looks like in an exhibition. And then that, that brings me to my current work. So all of this thought about the worker has led me to the worker bees. And uh, um, I make this current work, I'm in a bee suit. Um, I'm making these really large cyanotypes. So I'm using the original cyan cyanotype formula from 1842, which originally, which um, eventually, excuse me, became the blueprint uh, and was adopted by architects. And so all of the bees are going on about their life, doing their normal thing, uh, collecting their stores from the winter, and they become, they appear as little ghosts, little orbs of light, and because they're moving. And so many bees that gather together, like the shapes on the right, those are hundreds of bees crawling all over one another. And that's why the edges uh, is a sort of a soft edge, is because that's, a, that's actually like a, a moving um, group of bees. This is a 22 by 30 uh, with uh, salts and organic components. And so all the things that are happening with the photograph with the uh, cyanotype is underneath a, a, a barrier. Uh, and so the bees never touch the chemicals. This is a big piece of rolled plastic, like the kind you get at the hardware store. And then you see bees uh, all, everywhere you see the highlight areas, those are bees gathering. The, this starts to become not only about the worker, but uh, our environment um, and um, it starts to become more atmospheric. This piece was shown in the 2017 uh, Venice Biennale, and that's a giant swarm of bees in the center there. And that's a diptych and that's a, each panel here is about three foot by four foot. And then this is a double exposure um, image. Each panel here is about 22 by 30 inches. It starts to look a lot like outer space. It has a very cosmic feel to it. That is also a double, uh, double exposure. 
and one more 22 by 30 here. And that's the piece that I have in the momentum show. And this is um, the only piece that I'm showing uh, that is of dead bees. And so much like the medic images that I was thinking about all those many years ago, the bees carry their dead to the front of the hive as a ritual within their life cycle. Um, and I, I, when, I, when I saw this happen and when I read about this and watched this, it really made me feel like there were parallels between the worker bees and the essential workers um, right now in the pandemic. And I feel like people in, in the United States and also globally, we are, we are unified by death, but also in a hopeful way, we're, we're unified by the humanity that it takes to help one another through it. Um, this is the, a series of the Red Cross blueprints that, I'm, that I've done. And that's my um, website and my Instagram handle. And that is it. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for sharing, Brent. It was great to see a more complete set of your body of work after seeing what's in the exhibition. So thank you. Um, and that wraps up all of our conversations for the evening. If all of our artists would like to turn your video back on, we can open it up for questions um, and see if uh, I have anything. We have multiple channels here, so I'm gonna check all the boxes. Okay. Well, it doesn't look like there are any questions from our audience, but if any of you have questions for each other, now is the time. <laughs> and if not, we can just wrap it up, which is also totally fine. Um, we can also keep an eye on our um, Facebook page. If questions come up later, I can always tag you um, and we can keep the conversations going that way as well. Um, so if none of you have any questions, then um, I just wanna say thank you again for I, I, I have more of a comment. I just really enjoyed seeing everybody's work. Yeah. It was yeah. nice. Yeah. Me too. Very nice. Me yeah, too. me too. I, I'm so into it. I was like, can I just jump in? Can we just turn this into like <laughs> conversations? But I want to be mindful of everybody's time. Otherwise, we would be here for probably many hours. Um, I, I love uh, getting into that. So um, yeah, thanks for bringing that up, Brent. It was, it was really great. Um, yeah, and uh, hopefully I get to see more of this work in person. I, I think I've seen um, Deborah and Deb, your work. I remember seeing that exhibition. That was last fall? No, it was actually, it was in February. <laughs> was it? <laughs> yes, oh my gosh. It, it was Time right before feels... COVID. I know, it was yeah. right before COVID. Right. Yeah. Early. Yep. That's and right. actually, Deb and I both have work in the um, 20 North Gallery right now. Oh, uh, cool. That was bad. Person. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Awesome. Do you, you too? All oh, right. And Beth say, yeah. Sorry. I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I thought Beth did. Yeah. So, congratulations on the Biennale. That's awesome. Right? Yeah. Thanks, Deb. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I'm not thank surprised. You. Oh, thank you. That's very nice. Yeah. All right. Well, um, thank you all so much. Um, we have a thank you from an audience member as well. So um, enjoy your weekends and we look forward to seeing more work from you in the future. All right, thank Thanks you. So Thanks much. for my momentum. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye.